a couple of announcements while they're breaking down the band stuff. We have um, a creativity retreat workshop for women from Donna Blue Lachlan on her land in Michigan. Uh, two days and, uh, oh, Friday evening, June 2nd through Sunday evening, June 4th. And also Friday evening, July 7th through Sunday evening, July 9th. $200, an hour and a half outside of the city, and it's catered meals. It sounds like a romantic weekend for me. And then um, a performance composition workshop for playwrights, directors, actors, poets, and performance artists. Again, by Donna Blue Lachman. Nine-week exploration designed to, uh, designed to enter the roots of theater through bodywork, visualization, improvisation, and narrative. Okay, we would like to thank a couple of people here at the Metro Theater. Our special thanks to Patricia Bechtold, Marcia, yeah, Marcia, Marcia Jablonski, Mimi Waddell, Mindy Verson, Chris, Tino, Jeff, and Steve. Also, how many people, how many of y'all know Bridget Murphy? Right? Uh, she's coming back after a long illness. She's going to be doing Millie's Orchid Show at the Park West in July. So check your papers. You can sign up for the Big Goddess mailing list. Did anybody see the uh, Emmy Awards last night? Daytime Emmys? Is there anybody here who watches All My Children? Are there any people who watch the show? Did you know that Susan Lucci did not win again? 15 years in a row. She'd been nominated and she did not win. Now, I've got a personal theory about this whole thing. You want to know my personal theory? You cannot leave this place. You cannot leave this place and tell anyone else about this theory because Susan and I, although not friends, do see each other socially, you know? And this, this isn't really nice what I'm going to say, but Nina, I don't think, is nearly as nice as people thought she was. Anyway, I think that she, every year, if you're, gonna, if you're nominated for an Emmy, you submit a tape, a videotape, to the Blue Ribbon panel, and they view it, and then they decide who wins the Emmy, right? I think Susan submits rotten tapes. You know why? Because, do you, do you know who won this year? Erica Slezak. Do you know who Erica Slezak is? One person knows, right? But everybody knows Susan Lucci. Because every year she loses and everybody roots for her and everybody wants her to win. So that's, and, and no, I didn't win, but that's okay. Um, now, I am a goddess now, that's true. I've arrived. Well, I live in Chicago now. You can't ask for anything more like that. Okay. Now, our next performance artist is best described as the Rosalind Russell of the 90s. You're dying to know who this is, aren't you? She symbolizes the post-Dorothy Dorothy Parker era and the rebirth of the, the Algonquin Round Table. Please welcome Alma Turco. Well, thank you very much. I'll try to live up to that introduction. <laughs> I am Alma Turkle, and welcome to the Big Goddess Pow Wow, otherwise known as Little Women. <laughs> well, there's a lot of important people in the audience tonight, but among them is Louisa May Alcott. She's here tonight. Please identify yourself. Don't be shy. There she is, right in the end row there. Louisa May Alcott. Let's give her a big hand. <laughs> thank you for playing along. You know, when I was a little girl, I was going to read Little Women, but then I found out it wasn't about little women at all. It was about big, normal-sized people. <laughs> Turned me off completely, and I missed out on the entire experience. Never read the book, didn't see the movies. But you know, I wasn't really interested in that sort of thing. No, when I was a little girl, I wanted a train. I asked my father for a train every Christmas. Finally, he gave one to my brother. All that kid wanted to do was arrange the miniature people in the station house and decorate the landscape. <laughs> Needless to say, he's not welcome in today's military. <laughs> I come from a big Catholic family. 
Is it in the kind of Catholic family? I had, oh, six or seven brothers and sisters. My parents did everything the Pope told them to, and then we never heard from him. Not even a thank you note. I don't understand this man, the Pope. All he seems to do is travel the world, bossing people around and telling them what to do with their lives. As far as I'm concerned, that's a woman's job. <laughs> no, I think so. No, I don't really understand this Pope man. He lives in the house the size of the university, has an art collection to die for. And believe me, some people did. <laughs> the man has no money worries whatsoever, and he's celibate. What's wrong with the Holy See? Hasn't he seen the women of Rome? I have, and they're enough to make me think twice about myself. Oh, uh, the Pope doesn't have very much time for women, does he? But he certainly has a lot of time to tell a woman who she is and what she ought to be. Well, as far as I'm concerned, if he wants me to act more like a woman, he ought to try acting more like a man. Rustle up some wood, drop some bobcats. man takes that kind of action, I'll show him how vulnerable I can be. Yeah. Well, they tell me I ought to have all this Catholic stuff roll off my back. It's hard to let something roll off your back when it's been thrown in your face. Which brings me to my husband. Man's got a beautiful face. He's got a beautiful body, too, I'm not ashamed to tell you. In fact, I'm proud. I wouldn't trade him in for the world. He's terrific with the children. Shakes a mean martini and still has time to paint watercolors. <laughs> ah, sometimes when he tells me all about his day, my eyes glaze over. <laughs> but I love him. I love my children too, you know. People tell me I don't see my children often enough. I do. I see them frequently. There's nothing I enjoy more than to bounce my baby girl on my knee and ask her, what do you want to be when you grow up, doll? Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. Big world out there, a lot of choices. In fact, there's so many choices, I'm not alone. Of course, I am alone. We're all alone. But this isn't the time or the place to talk about that now. <laughs> That's for you to think about later when you're alone. Right now, we're here with friends to commiserate, hear some stories, listen to poetry, have some laughs. <laughs> some people call what we do art, other people call it entertainment. Not too long ago, Bob Dole called all of it poison. Maybe that's why he wants to cut our funding for the NEA. We wouldn't want to sink our tax dollars into any weapons of destruction now, would we? And I guess as long as I've mentioned Bob Dole, I may as well mention Newt Gingrich. I can't help myself. I'll tell you something. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of seeing photographs of this man which forced me to look up at him. You notice that? We're forced to look up at Newt Gingrich. The man has a monstrous double chin. There must be some surgical procedure to make that man more palatable. Well, perhaps stop him from talking, but he does say the darndest things, doesn't he? It was Newt who called feeding our school children in a school lunch program extortion of the American taxpayer. I don't know about you, but I'll wake up every night in a cold sweat screaming, what's wrong with us, America? Why don't we just stop feeding the children? <laughs> when are the working poor going to buy their own food? Stop taking it out of my pocketbook. Then I go to sleep, get up in the morning, take a dip in the pool, the masseuse arrives, and somehow I get to another day. <laughs> and well, you know, I've gotten through most of this day, and I'm going to get through the evening by smoking my cigar. You know, a cigar is not just a man's experience. As a matter of fact, the reason they put the band on the cigar originally was to protect a woman's gloves while she smoked. Of course, we don't wear gloves anymore, but we still have the band. Now, I haven't clipped the edge off here because, to tell you the truth, you need a guillotine to do so. And I used to have a little, little, little thing called a guillotine. And I had a lovely guillotine. It was made out of a tortoise shell, confiscated by a group of animal rights activists. Of course, mine was made in the old days when you could brutalize an animal and get away with it.
But I'm not going to do that now. I'm going to go backstage and light this up, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Good night. I've been Albert Ellis. Nor done. Our next performer is the founder of the Big Goddess Pow Wow. The godmother of my son, my best friend in Chicago. Her name is Paula Killen. And tonight, she's at the dance. Please welcome Paula Killen. like Madonna. <laughs> I'm afraid of being left out. Oh, but that is not a very attractive quality. Fear. <laughs> it just wouldn't be a party without me yanking up my dress now, would it? <laughs> oh, I am just going to down and be silent because I understand that stillness is a very attractive quality. <laughs> it reflects a sort of inner strength and dignity. I can achieve that. Oh, fuck. It is very hard to sit still while everyone else is dancing. <laughs> Maybe. If I dance alone, someone will see me, become attracted to me, and ask me to dance with them. <laughs> oh, but I've got to make it look like my dance was inspired. That in my stillness, I heard the music, and it moved me. One must be vaguely self-deprecating while dancing alone. You wouldn't want people to say that you're vain. Oh, oh my God. God. Look at that woman over there dancing alone. Oh, Jesus Christ. She thinks she's such a good dancer. She's not. She's just totally into herself. I am scared to death that everybody's thinking I'm a big weirdo when I dance alone. <laughs> they're probably they're not. Probably they're thinking about their own dance and what I'm thinking about them when I watch them. <laughs> and that, that reminds me of a little story. Okay. <laughs> story about two women. They work together, okay? One woman is a big mountain of a mother-type chubby person that everybody likes because she does a great job at work. The other woman is a cute little brunette, pouty lips and so on. She's kind of cute, but she thinks she's a total babe, so everyone says she's vain. Chubby mother woman and this other gal, good friends. Not like the kind of call on the phone, but like, you know, work friends. They like each other. So one day, then a couple of more days, and a couple more days past that. Little Miss got some. Realizes that chubby mother type woman has not been talking to her. So she gets her rubber pants all up into a bunch and marches on down to the break woman room where chubby mother woman is having a cup of coffee. She walks right up behind mom, taps her on the shoulder and says, Excuse me. Have I done something to piss you off? <laughs> because you really have not been very nice to me lately. Mom looks into her coffee cup and says, oh, this really has nothing to do with you. My husband's having an affair and I'm very unhappy. Honey, 
The world does not revolve around you. Oops. <laughs> one of the big problems with dancing alone. I, I could ask one of you to come up here and dance with me. Takers? All of it. Oh, God, no! <laughs> Yeah, yeah, see, I'm embarrassed now. Dance gone closer, fuck! <laughs> Plus, you probably want to see some of the other dancers, don't you? Like, the aerobic dancer. Or, the Grateful Dead dancer. The fun gal dancer. <laughs> Don't you think it's hot in here? Or the tiny dancer. <laughs> or the very best dancer of all. The black man dancer. <laughs> At once bold and then suddenly lyrical. A dance that comes from deep down in his groin, like places I've never been before, without a proper invitation. <laughs> and this observation makes me think about stereotypes <laughs> and how some people get left out. And that, that reminds me of a little story. <laughs> okay, one time when I'm about 13 or so, I have a black friend, a boy. Not a boyfriend, but a boy that would call me that I'd talk to. Paula Jean, uh, there's an Elijah King on the telephone for you. Oh, Mom. He's a boy <laughs> that I met at the Y. He's teaching me that game, the one everybody's playing uh, called Basketball. Basketball, Mom. I'll take it in my room. I had met Elijah at the, at the Y, but we had never really played basketball before. I invited him to come to my house one day when my parents weren't home. So why was he there? Like I said, I invited him. But I made him stand outside the door. I stood in the door jam, trying to act like, you know, a rock star or something. My neighbor, one Millie Schwamm, catches this act, and she wants to know what Paula Jean is doing talking to a black boy when her parents aren't home. She calls the police to inquire. The police show up with the same set of questions. Elijah King doesn't even think to tell the truth. He just spouts out a series of lies. I'm the Fuller Brush Man. No, paper boy. Actually, I'm selling candy for a very worthy... The police thought this was all total horseshit and took Elijah away in their car. I never heard from Elijah King again. Probably... Probably because he was embarrassed because he was left out and just had to lie. When I was about 21 or so, I got this job as a cocktail waitress, the first of many such jobs at the Club LaRue El Grande in Oakland, California. The Club LaRue was owned, operated, and solely patronized by black people. I was going to Cal Berkeley at the time and thought it was very clever to dress in gingham kids wear. I was a novelty at the Club LaRue El Grande. <laughs> where the postal worker clientele would often inquire just to what I was doing there, serving drinks rather slowly and dressed like a retarded toddler. <laughs> I didn't even bother with the truth, I just make shit up like, you know what? I'm really a very popular blues singer in New York City. And due to this big movie contract, I'm, I'm here to do research. And when people try to be really friendly with me and give me their drugs and stuff, I'd say, oh, God, I'd love to. But since my near-fatal overdose, I just had to cut back. But thanks, babe. At the end of the summer, I quit the job, picked up my paycheck, and left. The world of the Club de Ruel Grande did not revolve around moi. I went back there, though, a year later, with some of my white college friends, because I'd started to dress a little better and was hoping that the clientele would recognize it. And when I walked in, it was like, hey, hey, Paula, where have you been? Oh, we wonder what happened to you. We knew you was a lying little thing, but you meant no harm. And they bought me drinks, 
and my friends drinks and let me win at liar's dice and play my own songs on the jukebox. And it was like some big ass dream come true. Those people had liked me. And when I left, they missed me. So every time now when I meet a black person, I just want to walk up to them and say, hey, I have mixed and mingled with many of your kind. And they enjoyed my company. So please, accept me easily. <laughs> After the last dance, I was really drunk. <laughs> and my feet hurt because I'd been the fun gal dancer and everybody stomped on him. But I was wearing a great fucking dress. <laughs> I took off my shoes, got behind the wheel of my car because I was going to an after party conveniently located at the house of a friend. However, I'd never been to my friend's house before. Wasn't quite sure where it was. And I didn't have my glasses. I don't see too well at night. And it began to pelt down rain. But I drove aimlessly out into the night. I got really fucking lost. I thought maybe some radio. That ought to calm me down. But no, I started to totally freak out. Where the fuck am I? Green from one side of the road to the other, trying to read the numbers on the houses as they went by. <laughs> Finally, I stopped that car, got out, and walked right up to the front porch of some house so I could read those numbers up close and personal. I was sure I could hear the people inside saying, Look, honey, another one of those drunk white party girls. Hand me my shotgun. <laughs> I got back into my car. Not at all comforted by the knowledge of where I was. And I just started to cry. At first I was like, low moany ones. And then, snot and tears and mascara fucking up my party dress. Yeah. I got to my friend's house and walked up to her door, which she opened up and said, Oh my God, Paula, <laughs> hey, <laughs> come in. I mean, everybody else is gone, but. And my friend rocked me gently back and forth till I stopped crying. Then I went home. <laughs> Next day, I woke up <laughs> and I began to recount the evening before. Looked great, danced lots, got drunk. Then I called my friends, like, immediately. Because I didn't want her to think I was, like, some fragile freak. I'm like, okay, um, I'm sorry. Hi. Hi, um, you know last night. A, a complete mistake. I mean, my boyfriend and I, we just can't stop fighting. And my period, it won't stop coming. <laughs> and my friend's like, hey, hey, it's okay. I'm just sorry you were so lost. And, you know... Whenever I think about being lost, I think about Tracy Chapman, the folk singer. <laughs> because of course you're all asking me, Paula, whatever happened to Tracy Chapman, the folk singer? <laughs> of course I know. Tracy Chapman, famous folk singer. One day Tracy, top of the charts. Next day, bottom of the barrel. Those Hollywood boys just cut her loose let her go with her empty guitar case in one hand and her little hat in the other. Tracy took the bus home. First place Tracy goes to is this bar, one that she always used to go to, you know. Sometimes she'd play at and sometimes she'd just sit and listen. When she walked in, everyone was like, hey, hey, Tracy, where you been? We were wondering what's been happening with you. The lady bartender said, you know, Tracy, we're just so sorry to hear about your music. And that, that reminded Tracy of a little story. 
It's a love story. And it goes something like this. One day, you wake up and you realize that you have found the perfect lover. And in the face of that, you lose yourself to the job of becoming the perfect lover in return. If your lover wants into your head, you do the best to open it up. <laughs> if your lover wants something material, say boots. You say Tony Lama. If, if lover wants car, you say red hot Miata. If the lover wants love, you turn into a brazen sex machine. One day, you're at the house of lover, and you're snooping around like you do at lover's house. And you find this little scrap of paper, and you pick it up, and on it, it's got three rather ugly words. Not good enough. And you don't know what that means, but you decide to take it real personal. <laughs> and you start saying shit you know you don't mean. Like one more time, I hit liar's jackpot. Snake guys, snake guys, snake guys. Hey, you know what? I want all my shit back, and I am leaving. <laughs> Lover smiles gently, and then closes the door lightly. You are definitely left out. World stops. Failure dictates that you hawk your guitar, sell your songs, and go home to face the music. Lady bartender's like, whoa, Tracy, like, wow. <laughs> had no idea it had been so difficult. And another girl, probably jealous, said, well, you know, Tracy, it's probably better this way because they just would have chewed you up and spit you out. And another girl says, but Tracy, at least they got to hear your songs. And then from the very end of the bar, spoke a big mountain of a mother-type chubby woman. Tracy, honey, I'm glad you're back. My husband's having an affair, and I need to talk to somebody else who's been through some pain. A sigh fell over the bar. Till somebody popped some money in the jukebox, and the music started. And one by one, the women got up to dance together, leaving one girl's boyfriend on a bar stool to muse the fact that he will never fucking dance with another dude. <laughs> And if it weren't for women, I wouldn't dance at all. But he liked the way that they looked. Beautiful. Dancing in a circle. Kind of like a ring around the rose. And Tracy. Tracy was totally fucked up. Cause, you know, her career had hit the skids and she had to come home. But tonight, tonight her lady friends would not let her feel left out they'd make her believe that the whole world revolved around her. And this dance was only just beginning. That was Paul Killen. Our next performer is Donna Rose. She's a poetess, a provocateur. She has performed the written, the spoken word since 1978. She has mellowed somewhat with marriage and monogamy, but she's still gonna kick ass. Tonight she's gonna do the Sermon on the Power of Tears. Welcome Donna Rose. But now I'm found 
I was stone blind. But now I see. Good evening. I was just having a little bit of sacrament this evening. And I see it seems that a number of you have been joining me in fellowship, so to speak. Don't stop. I'm sure that there are going to be many of you tonight in the audience who are perhaps among the pros that cropped up, <laughs> identity impaired, but that's all right. Because for the purposes of this particular performance, I am going to be the right Reverend Dr. Donna Rose and you are gonna be the congregation. Now, are you with me? Now, that's what I like, cooperation. Because the other thing is, I know that many of you are worshiping at those other temples, like Leona's. <laughs> or for some of my brothers and sisters, Ann Sather's, North or South. We're going to break it down front this evening for you right here. This sermon, wait a minute, let me put this sacrament down. <laughs> Actually, it should be a woman, but we'll go along with it for the evening. And now that I know that, I would, I would almost guess that there are some other queers in the audience tonight beside myself. Thank you. And now that we got that part out of the way, I know that there may be one or two therapists in the congregation. <laughs> we got plenty of therapists, and I don't knock them. Every once in a while, though, I would like a plumber or a carpenter, but I work with what we got. I want to share with you this evening a message about the power of tears, particularly those tears that are shed by a woman. You see, because when a woman fights to give forth a new life, she cries. And if that same new life should take ill, and be unresponsive to medication. A woman is going to cry. Now, I know that there are a certain three to seven days out of the month that women are more prone to cry than in others. And I have also heard tell that otters possess tear ducts but I will submit to you this evening that an otter is unable to call forth its tears in the manner that a woman will. Are you with me? <laughs> Perhaps a woman in the workplace is working with co-workers who are uncooperative. And a woman will wear a mask because, you see, she has to go forth and make a living for herself and loved ones. And so a woman will sometimes hold back her tears. And at the end of the workday, perhaps sisters working in construction, and you know they're not too keen on her in that particular workplace. Or perhaps she's a clerical worker. Another euphemism for a welfare recipient. And a woman is going to cry. When she leaves the workplace, whether she takes the bus, or if she's managed to save a few extra dollars at the end of the pay period and is able to take a taxi cab, a woman will go into her pocket or her purse, pull out the key to the door, stick it in the lock, turn it, open the door knob, rush inside, 
fling herself across the bed and cry in the sanctity of her bedroom because she doesn't want to show the world what she's crying about. And frequently, that same woman may be caught in her tears by her children. And she'll, she'll try to say, oh, baby, it was just something in my eye. But a mother will try to protect her child from her tears. I, I know about this firsthand, you see, because even though I'm remarkably well preserved, I have a 22-year-old son, Malcolm. And when he was a, a young boy, a little boy, he would look at me with the wonderment that little black boys look at their mothers. You see, because he caught me in my tears. And his face was upturned to me and his little afro curls framed his face. And he said, Mama, your eyes are so pretty. Because, you see, when I cry, my eyes turn a lighter shade of brown. And I couldn't tell him that the precipitating factors behind all of the tears he may have witnessed was certainly not pretty. But you see, it wasn't his place to know. Because as a black man in America, he's guaranteed to get his own set of tears as he becomes a man. So I didn't need to burden him in that way. Or maybe a woman will behold a thing of beauty. Perhaps it's a, a woodland, an ocean. All you got to do is look outside of your window and be witness to the glory. And a woman can be moved to tears. Or perhaps, maybe on this particular Sunday afternoon, you have watched the one millionth rerun of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women and the part where little gentle Beth March dies, you ain't worth your estrogen if you don't break out the Kleenex. <laughs> and so a woman cries. Now I don't want you men folk to feel left out. I'm just trying to share with you that women are blessed to have this pressure releasing mechanism built in. And women are more free to cry. And so, I submit to you this evening that that is the correct and proper function of the tear ducts, to wash all what's ailing you out. Or perhaps, perhaps you've been met by loss. Are there any of you tonight who have been met by loss? I know I'm not the only one. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, wait a minute, I will get to you. Show your hand over here. I want to see your hands if you have met with loss. Oh, this individual here is crossed. Raise your hand, baby. Don't be shy. Don't make me come down and pick you out. All right. Anyone else? Don't be shy. Anyone over here been met by loss? I know, I know you have. Don't turn around, baby. I'm looking right at you. Yes. All right, that's what I like. Don't be shy, because... I've been that in Lord. Oh, baby. Pass the plate to this individual over here, because they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and what you got to do when you've been met by loss, maybe your lover's left you. You know, that's the, the time when you really feel like crying, when the love line's been disconnected. Yeah, when your love line has been cut off, when you're plagued by miscommunication and doubt, you oh, cry. Yeah. You cry. Loudly at first and then softly into your pillow. And it doesn't matter how butch you are. I don't care how many motorcycles you ride. <laughs> A woman's gonna cry. And I don't care how thin you are and afraid to mess up the mascara. You must cry. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to split the tape. But I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. 
You are never too stoic. You are never too intelligent. It doesn't matter how many letters you have behind your name. What you have to do is cry, sometimes alone. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you have somebody to hold on to. And what I'm going to tell you is, don't wait. Or else you'll do like I did. I went a year without shedding a tear. I had headaches, backache, neuralgia, body aches, all kinds of things because of my selfish nature. And I did something that I didn't think I would do. I ran to a therapist. The woman had buckets for what was inside of me. So what I just want to share with you, I'm not a perfect person, if only that I were. I'm just telling you, you've got to cry sometime. So however you do it, just make sure it's some of that good, gut clenching, chest heaving, snot dripping. Your hair should become nappy if you got a permanent, and if y'all are the straight of persuasion, it should be plastered to your forehead. <laughs> Because what I have found, and I hope you take this with you this evening, is that those tears become the catalyst for any necessary change. Amen. Donna Rose. Our next performer is a co-producer of the Big Goddess Pow Wow. She is a champion. Wait, let me get the wording on this right. A national poetry slam champion and all-around fun gal. She is currently seen spreading the word of the Lord in late night catechism at the Ivanhoe Theater, where she's packing the houses. Please welcome Lisa Biscani. Real women are defined by light. It's their best dress. They wash their hair with it, paint their nails with it, they hang it from their necks and their wrists. Real women can see themselves in their calves. No one knows this better than the average drag queen. <laughs> of course, I suppose it's a little strange putting the words average and drag queen in the same sentence, but I guess that's why I love them. Call them what you will, drag queen, gender illusionist. <laughs> Guardians of the Fabulous. <laughs> they rock my world. Women far more biologically disadvantaged than I am. <laughs> devoting themselves almost exclusively to everything that glimmers. Forcing their feet to that abnormal status quo pointing. All shades artificial painting them into a larger than life canvas. Hormone silk voices beseech us for our time and attention. Overlook the ankles. You know. <laughs> the hands are much smaller in context, they promise. <laughs> Never mind the Adam's apple, honey. Look to the light. It was hot so hot. That's when you snap it, love one, stick to vinyl. And when it's hot, it's just so hot. We didn't care. We were watching the gay pride parade the annual mass for the brothers and sisters of the church. I felt like I'd snuck away from my usual Catholic ceremony to attend Lutheran services. <laughs> I had never seen so many politicians in my life. Isn't it funny how policies tend to flip-flop when there's a float involved? <laughs> cars, watched the thumping, bumping club floats, and accepted far more free condoms than I, even at the height of my considerable charm, could ever hope to use. <laughs> if I use them, which I don't, 
Uh, it's a strenuous hypocrisy, I know, to, to wag a warning finger at my gay male friends and then slip off for a skin-to-tissue lark, but I don't always do everything that's good for me. I do what I can do. And I hope the gods of penalty and error take power naps. <laughs> all in all, the parade was a really great time. But I felt that something was missing, you know? Positive sexual identity and community affirmation are all very well and good, but no event is butt and shut without statement and parade. I needed rage and refinement. I needed the detailed awareness of other worlds. I needed carefully altered curves, well-placed angles, finish ad infinitum, and most importantly, I needed attitude I could cut with a chainsaw. <laughs> I needed a queen. <laughs> I was rewarded when the sequins on her majorette costume caught the sun in cups, <laughs> emptying every time she moved. Her six shades of shadow pushed her pencil brows even higher, her lip liner eight shades darker than her lipstick, the sweat underneath her nylons making her hard brown curves glisten. She looked like Whitney Houston on a particularly adventurous day. <laughs> She was long and she was tall, oh, and there was nothing stronger anywhere next to her step. And just before she left me, she leaned down to the curb where I was sitting, leaned forward so I could smell her opium and said, say, sugar, do you have a brother? <laughs> yes, I do, my heart, I thought. And unfortunately, he could never love you as much as I do now. And she laughed, laughed all the way on back to her gold fillings and walked away. And I thought, if that's the picture that my gender gives you, well then you keep it, girl. Carry it always and carry it close. I'll say this for the city of Los Angeles. No other city can top its penchant for spectacle. It's pain and anger manifested in earthquakes and riots. It's domestic disputes giving new meaning to the words road trip. And it's parties. Well, on a recent trip to Los Angeles, I went to an AIDS benefit slash masquerade ball with my girlfriend Pleasant and her boyfriend Photo. <laughs> I didn't make that up. It was drag queen Arama. I was in heaven. In fact, almost all the guys dressed in drag, even Pleasant's boyfriend photo. And I gotta tell you, there's something intimidating about a six foot two inch man transformed into a six foot eight inch silver lame spectacle through the less than benevolent omnipotence of spiked heels. <laughs> Pleasant and photo, well, photo was slim enough that tra drag wasn't such a stretch, you know? And that slip dress of his, hit his thighs right where the muscles planed. And he could drop his eyes, you know, that way. Drop them away from your gaze and then raise them back up with more meaning than was ever intended to fit in a moment. And although he still led with his shoulders, sat with his knees east-west, <laughs> and wobbled a bit bow-legged in his girlfriend's cruel shoes, I was so jealous. Jealous of those who have so many ways of knowing beauty. Well, the party got progressively hotter and more crowded and smokier and sweatier, and I wasn't even surprised when the fire department showed up. <laughs> I wasn't even surprised when they broke out their megaphones and asked everybody to leave, telling us that we could come back in after they got a head count. I was surprised to be greeted by at least 10 young, unsmiling Ary mem Aryan members of LA's finest, fresh from a bit of knuckle dragging at the Rodney King Cotillion, they weren't in a party mood. And I thought, you know, we waited outside that club 25 minutes, so I thought I was gonna go up to one of the officers and ask when we'd be allowed to, to go back in. So, drenched in Midwestern normalcy, <laughs> wholesome as the waving prairie, <laughs> Conservative enough to shit diamonds, I approach. <laughs> Excuse me, officer. I was wondering when we could go back in. I think you need to leave now. But, 
We were told, I think you need to leave now. But I think you need to leave now. And I looked around and I noticed that the cops' arrogance had transformed a peaceful situation into a potential free-for-all. The queens were screaming and demanding to be let back into the club. And the cops just ignored them and dismissed them and things got hotter and more brittle. Finally, in an attempt to scare us off, the police brought out their helicopters. Talk about your culture shock. Oppression in the Midwest is much more mundane. <laughs> Normally, the strategy is this. When the choppers arrive, their high-watt halogen headlights preceding them, everybody scatters. The light is malignant, the light is betrayal, everyone runs from the light. Not this time. <laughs> it was like greeting an old friend. One hundred queens attention from those tired old cops to their complete reason for being. <laughs> One hundred queens remembered light is vitality's hiding place. One hundred queens remembered that light will ne never let the spirits sleep as they turned and raised themselves up and up and took that gloriously clean punchline beat and said, Hi! 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 And they waved and they blew kisses and they sang a few bars of We Shall Overcome. <laughs> a few bars was all that anybody could remember. <laughs> I wondered what the LAPD was thinking. If you want a queen to leave a party, it's usually not a good idea to give them a spotlight. <laughs> What was next? Oh, the spotlight's not working, boys. We'd have to break out the 70s disco. <laughs> I saw a couple of the cops laugh, and that reduced the boiling point considerably. The chapters, choppers flew off, the queens clicked away. It was a draw. No losers. No winners. No winners, for sure. The beginning of a relationship has to be one of the most mindless times humans can know. <laughs> your blood beats your smarts in a race to the surface of your skin, and there you stand. All hail the queen of the gorge, nether regions. <laughs> he was talking that talk. The one with the muted consonants, low registers, and intermittent soft smiling. I was dating Barry White, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and soon enough, time was rushing and I was listening to the buzzing of the room and the meaty sounds that sex without love can make. There were no robbers to be found. It was over that evening. I found out later that he'd been shooting speed. I found out later that he had an affair with a former prostitute and a heroin addict, and you always find out things later. It was nobody's fault but my own. I rode the wrong cowboy home. By contrast, my current boyfriend is a nice guy. A really, really nice guy. A shining, exemplary model cast in the painfully detailed old world nice guy tradition. <laughs> And the hardest thing that I have ever had to do is to look into those brown eyes past that goofy, crooked smile and say, baby, I fucked up. There was a guy before you, and now I have to go get tested. And I thought he'd scream and throw things, but all he said was, oh, gonna give you a ride? And on the day of the examination, I was so worried I didn't even notice that he brought me flowers. Are we a 90s couple or what? First he brought me flowers, then he took me to the clinic. 